Welcome to SB Talks. Today is Wednesday, March 6th, and I am joined, as ever, by our Chief Investment Officer, Nick Ryder. Today, we will be talking Australian inflation and GDP data, the wrap on the Australian reporting season, and the relentless march of US equities. Welcome, Nick. Thank you, Vinny. Welcome to all our listeners. Let's start locally this week. Uh, since we last recorded, we've had inflation data with December quarter GDP set for release later today. What are you anticipating in the numbers? Uh, it should be a fairly subdued result. I mean, we've had some of the partial numbers come out over the last week, and there were sort of some unders and overs. So exports will be a contributor of about 0.6% to GDP over the quarter. Uh, government spending a little bit softer. So uh, the, the consensus is around that 02 for the quarter, which is a pretty slow pretty, number. Yeah. There's uh, a, a fairly pessimistic tone, I think, ahead of this yeah, release. Yeah, and that's similar to the prior quarter. So that would be two quarters in mm. a row of 02 and that would take annual growth down from 2.1 to 1.4. Mm. Uh, we've discussed before on the podcast the per capita recession, so that would definitely be a continuation of that, given that population growth is, is a lot stronger than those numbers. So when you strip out the impact, the growth impact of all the inflation, uh, sorry, immigration that we've had in the country that's a really quite a meek number and potentially a, a signal that the RBA's rate increases have certainly started to have their impact. Yeah, definitely. Um, and that's what we'll get more detail on today is the consumer spending number, which gets released today along with the GDP results. And uh, that's actually been fairly flat. You know, so we got a big surge in spending kind of post-COVID and then the last 12 months or so, it's really just been sideways. So people just have been tightening their belts. Um, decrease, in, 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 decrease in discretionary spares. In volume terms, yeah. yeah, but not necessarily in nominal terms. Mm -hmm. Obviously, we're still getting price rises coming through. So, yeah, it'll be a be a fairly soft result. The numbers are roughly in line with kind of where the RBA is at. Um, if they do come out at those numbers. So it, look, if it's, it's weaker than that or stronger than that, it could have a bearing on the next rate move, but probably unlikely to change the RBA's kind of, you know, policy deliberations in coming mm -hmm. months. It feels like we've got a pretty strong lead from what information is available already of where they're going to land. And, and while the economy is, is, let's say, spluttering somewhat or just staggering forward, we still see unemployment uh, at, at very sort of healthy, uh, healthy low rates. We're seeing um, just the property market show signs of, of growth again. So counter counteracting the need to cut rates to sort of stimulate the economy. We've got those other factors that will probably continue to give the uh, RBA pause for thought in charging into rate cuts too quickly. Yeah, well, that's right. So we got um, in the last few weeks another... Um uh, data on the property market showed continued price growth. I think it was 0.6% yeah. for the month of February. So, you know, the RBA wouldn't be too happy about that. And we've seen some pickup in, in housing turnover as well as people can see uh, lower rates coming and uh, and also tax cuts as well for some people. So it all that sort of helps to some degree offset some of the slowness in, uh, in consumer spending. You've been firmly in the camp of interest rate cuts will be coming later rather than sooner some of this weaker economic data? Does that change your views much, if anything? Uh, probably not. Um, so the market's centred on August, September as the first rate cut. And I mean, we don't know what data we're going to get between now and then, but that sort of seems likely based on the numbers we've seen recently. Um, you know, inflation has, you know, we got the monthly numbers for, for January, Um and you know they were mainly around the goods, so we we don't get all the numbers, yep. uh, and they were okay, I guess. You know, so continuing that disinflation theme. So I think, but it's more of a gradual yeah, wind down on inflation rather than a rapid return yeah, to target. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Mm. Now staying on that theme, we've had since we last recorded uh, U.S. and uh, European inflation data coming through. What's what's the trend that you're seeing there? Yeah, so um, look, I still think that the general theme of disinflation, that story is still intact, uh, as I wrote about in the latest monthly report that came out yesterday. Uh, but we did see January, sort of February numbers um, that sort of pick up a little bit, you know, around the, that turn of the new year, potentially companies putting through their annual price rises mm -hmm. in January. Um, so, for example, in Europe, 
the core inflation number went from negative um, 0.9 in January to plus 0.7 in right. February, and the annual rate uh, slowed from 3.3 to 3.1, and that was above expectations. People thought it would get slow to 2.9, so a little bit of a surprise there. And in the US, the same sort of theme. We only have the January numbers. Uh, but yeah, they were a bit higher than what was expected, and and really, uh, the monthly number in in January was kind of a bit bit firmer, um, and particularly, you know, that sticky services inflation and housing yeah. inflation was where some of the, yeah. the the surprise was. And you've you've talked about those areas on the podcast before, and been drivers of why you thought that the rate cuts in the US would be coming a little bit later than the market had already anticipated. So that probably is again a continuation of what you've been expecting there yeah yeah i mean we always knew it was going to be a bit bumpy you know the path back to two percent wasn't a nice straight line and the final mile as they call it was going to be harder to cross um and so i think there's evidence of that uh and fed officials have really been kind of latching on to that in recent recent weeks um they kind of i think they realized they jumped the gun maybe a little bit late last year of sort of signaling rate cuts and now they're kind of you know they've walked back from those um and are now kind of pushing them back and so we've seen kind of rate cuts in europe um and the us go to june now uh, and we had i think six rate cuts probably in december and now we're priced in so there an anticipation that we'd get six rate cuts over in, the course of 2024 yeah and now year. we're kind of in that three just over three to four range seems um, a lot more probably reasonable yeah than rational yeah and that's and you've got to remember the fed publishes their own dot plots so the median dot plot had three for the year anyway so the market's more kind of converging on where the fed's mm -hmm. own views were um so i think that's probably better better pricing really yeah, more, more realistic more sensible yeah know. we've talked china a few times on the in the podcast in recent weeks um the national people's congress convenes this week they set their growth target objective for the year it's come in at a dare i say very predictable five percent which looks like quite an ambitious target for them given some of the challenges we've talked about and recent information has sort of built upon that or continued that theme we've seen apple report sort of significant drop in sales through through china and just a, a trend of um economic weakness there yeah so i think no one was particularly surprised so we've had the yeah the national people's congress um which is their version of parliament um meeting this week and uh premier lee ki chiang um, did his work report. Um, he's not doing a press conference. So mm. for the last 30 years, he's done a press conference at the end. He, that, that won't be going forward. So there's some speculation, you know, a, a consolidation of power in President Xi. Right. Um, further consolidation. Yeah, further power. consolidation. Yeah. But, uh, yeah, the work report basically said, you know, growth of around 5%, very much the same as last year. Inflation around 3%. Now, that's a bit of a challenge for them because inflation last year was just 0.2 mm. um, and, uh, and a fiscal deficit of 3%, which is sort of similar to last year. So, you know, a lot of people said 5% growth. That'll be a bit of a stretch for them. They got 5.2 last year, but that was a bit of a rebound from the COVID the re their re numbers. Their belated reopening. Yeah, to so, so to match that this year looks challenging. Um, Particularly when they don't have any of their traditional stimulus measures to pull out. Yeah, well, that's right. I mean, the fiscal deficit of three is about the same as last year. So there's not a huge boost in terms of, you know, fiscal expansion there. Uh, they did announce these new ultra long dated treasury bond issuance of a trillion yuan or about 140 billion US. Um, so that's, I don't think they're counted in the deficit numbers. So, you know, maybe at the margin that, that helps, but no one's really getting too excited about it. You know, as you said, Apple, you know, Apple's interesting, you know, um, yeah, I guess it, it points to the consumer in China sort of buying cheaper phones so that, bell, that bellwether product of the apple iphone yeah. You know. yeah the premium product you know mm -hmm. so they were last year they had were the number two um seller of phones in china now they're number four so their market shares slipped and their sales in the first six weeks of this mm -hmm. year are down 24 percent. so some belt tightening going on a more in, a in more china. frugal consumer yeah. there in china mm. 
Uh, Australian pro- re- reporting season uh, just wrapped up, yep. uh, end of February. Any significant conclusions or, or takeaways from what you've seen? No, the aggregate numbers were pretty much in line with long-term averages. So 40% of companies beat, 32% missed. Uh, revenues grew about 6%, which is like marginally ahead of inflation. So there wasn't a lot of volume growth that went on. Um, there was some some trimming to full year EPS estimates of about 0.8 percent, which is typical when you know at, at the half year. So no great surprises in the aggregate numbers. I think the interesting, more interesting thing was the sort of commentary going on, you know, from companies in terms of their guidance to the market of what their tr- their trading conditions are. Or yeah, their yeah. So revenues, as I said, weren't were okay. Um, I think the interesting thing was cost control. Uh, so the companies that beat earnings, you know, were really focused on controlling costs. So they managed to do that reasonably well uh, outside the healthcare and resources sectors where costs mm. are a bit more of a problem. Um, the other thing that was interesting was, you know, those companies in the consumer discretionary sector really struggling, you know, with the consumer belt tightening. Mm. Um, and so consumers are very much more focused on companies offering you know, good value. So we saw that come through. Uh, even, but despite the weak sales momentum there, um, that sector actually did pretty well um, in February, rose 11% because people kind of latched on to the idea that tax cuts and interest rate cuts mm. would would give that sector a bit of a revival. It's almost the, the market looking 12 months forward, yeah, as they typically yeah. do, and say, okay, this has been definitely, definitely a difficult period for the consumer, but if we get these stage three tax cuts coming through, plus interest rate cuts in the back end of the year, then suddenly the consumer might have a, a late year resurgence. Yeah. But um, that's, quite a, that's quite a picture of, I guess, the companies that did beat, did it by managing costs rather yeah. than having any outsized revenue growth. So again, it probably reiterates that GDP sort of feel of, of just a general note of caution about the Australian economy right now. Yeah, I mean, the other things for me is uh, dividends this year are going to be lower um, than last year. So there's a, that's sort of not really a bright spot in terms of dividends. Companies spending more on CapEx, uh, less on buybacks and dividends. Uh, what else was interesting? Just uh, there were more write downs in the property sector. So right. we, we started to see office valuations really kind of get trimmed as we get more kind of transaction evidence. There's, what, been, that, there's been more sales. So valuers can now go, oh, well, that one sold at this benchmark. Mm-hmm. So we're going to, you know, write and what, what magnitude of um, write downs are we seeing in some of that office space? So. Um, peak to trough, we're down about 15% right. kind of on average across that sector. Um, so, you know, will we, you know, are we close to the bottom? Probably not too far mm. off if we see interest rates start to come down. Um, but these things are always lagging, mm. as we know. Not peak to trough would be quite a time period now. So it's not just that they've declined, they've had zero growth through that period too, where, where historically had grown sort of at least in line with inflation. So, yeah. Very interesting. Um, talk, keeping on the theme of equities, U.S. equities continue their, dare I say, almost relentless march. Um, how do you think about that as, as an investor? Yeah, it's very interesting. So I was reading a research report from one of the banks and they said, you know, this has been a very fast uh, rise in equities. They've been up 20% in the U.S. in four calendar months. And yeah. that's it has happened a few times before, but it's usually coming out of like COVID or GFC, so out of a recession where they've been beaten down. Yeah. It's or, almost like a rebound off straight off the a big cut. That's right. Or uh, we also saw it during the uh, dot com boom. So, you know, I think there's some parallels with a bit of both, though. So mm-hmm. even though we're not, we weren't in a recession. There was recession like pricing. You know, there was an expectation of a recession. Uh, so we have seen a bit of a relief rally about that. And then obviously, you know, with the Magnificent Seven, there are some parallels to the dot-com boom, although, you know, we would say that, you know, the valuations are probably more justified this time compared to in in the late 90s. Well, the, I guess the, the Mag 7, or, or the majority of them anyway, have, have cash flows, yeah. have, have profits there. Does it make you have a, a, a touch of caution around your allocation to international equities? Uh, no, no. I think, you know, as I wrote yesterday, what I think could happen, even though maybe, you know, the MAG-7 might run out of steam at some point, what we are seeing a little bit um, is some broadening out, actually. Mm. 
So it's, you know, now markets like Japanese markets at a record high, Australian markets at a record high, European, Canada. Uh, we're seeing sectors that were lagging uh, start to get a bit of a bid. So we're seeing the mar- market, you know, which was a very narrow rally kind of broaden out to yeah. potentially some of these sectors uh, and countries that have been left behind. Yeah. And possibly seeing, um, yeah, as you said, some of the names of some of the companies that actually are, are trading into better circumstances, the market now and to recognize that and not just being a sort of a very heavy rebound on some of those growth to- stocks or technology stocks in particular. Okay, well, happy to maintain your allocations, happy to remain yeah. invested. And uh, as you said, it's been a, a very healthy few months for investors with our exposures there. So uh, to a degree, long may that continue within the the realms of uh, a reasonable growth. Yeah, yeah we yeah. don't want that trend to continue for another few months, or we would be certainly needing to make uh, adjustments. Oh, absolutely. I mean, I think we 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 are. You know, as I wrote yesterday, we're overdue a pullback. It's it's very rare to get the market rising sixteen out of the last eighteen weeks. Um, so I wouldn't be surprised to see a pullback. And we did see one uh, last night. Market was off one percent. You know, on those softer um, PMI data out of the US. Yeah, so I think a little bit of um, venting of yeah. steam every now and again is certainly healthy to, uh, to a functioning market. Well, an excellent recap there, Nick. Uh, I think we, we hold the course for now. Uh, thank you to all our listeners and thank you again, Nick. We'll speak again soon. Take care. Take care.